This is Cookie Batch, and I'm going to be doing this session with Brad Harris and Linda Thorberg. It's called The Mystery of the Mats. Has a coach ever asked you, can I use that mat over here? And you're the judge. Do you have the answer? We'll find out. Are a mystery. <laughs> so why are mats a mystery? Well, mats have changed over time, and the wording that describes mats is sometimes confusing. Then there's formal names for mats versus nicknames that coaches and judges will sometimes use. In addition, different manufacturers call them different names. They're sometimes referred to in inches and in centimeters. And two and two doesn't often equal four when you're making these conversions. And for judges, we're pretty much oblivious to the mat choreography while we're scoring the prior routine. So it's not necessarily something that we get a chance to pay attention to. So the mystery of the mats is gonna start with a matching game and Detective Linda Thorberg and Detective Brad Harris are going to help. The game is called Do You Know the Name of These Mats? And these are going to be your choices. You can select from Skill Cushion, Throw Mat, Sting Mat, Crash Mat, Panel Mat, Base Mat, Competition Landing Mat, Resi Pit, Porta Pit, Pit Pillow, or Bar Release Mat. And there may be more than one correct answer. So we're going to start with one that's pretty simple. What is the name of this mat? It's a panel mat. It's also called a base mat when it's unfolded and it's around one and a quarter inches. What is this mat? This is a pit pillow. And this mat? This is a, called a bar release mat, and it's an AAI version of the pit pillow. And what are these mats called? These are called competition landing mats. Sometimes you'll hear coaches refer to them as base mats, and they come in different sizes. The ones you see at the top are 20 centimeter mats, think about eight inches. The ones at the bottom are 12 centimeter mats, about four and a half to five inches. So why don't we use more 20 centimeter mats? Your choices are that they're not as firm for secure landings, they're too firm for crash landings, they're too heavy to move quickly, or they don't fit on the equipment track. The answer is they don't fit on the equipment track. And Brad Harris is gonna to talk to us about that in a little bit. What is the name of this mat? This is a skill cushion, it's four inches. Sometimes it's called a throw mat. And this one? This is a sting mat. It's easy for us to remember because there's a bumblebee on it, reminding us of a sting. And this one? This is an 8 inch skill cushion, sometimes called a crash mat, but sometimes they'll call it a throw mat too. This is another version, it's called an AAI softy mat. It's a skill cushion with just a little softer cushioning, and it's generally used for training and warm ups, but not in competition. We might see this sometimes when gymnasts are uh, on vault and they're not yet flipping their vaults, they're landing on their back and this one might be put in because it's soft, hence it's a softy. What are these called? These are called resi pits or porta pits. The resi pit is a brand name for Resolite and other companies also make them and in general it's a mat that exceeds 24 inches in height. Have you solved the mystery of the mat yet? 
If not, let's ask our detectives for some clues. We're going to start with Brad Harris from Tampa Bay Turners, and he is on the USA Gymnastics DP Committee. All right, so we're going to kind of go through the different sizes of mats that are acceptable during competition. I think the easiest and smartest way to do this would be what we typically see at competitions in regard to what we call a landing mat and the difference between a 12 centimeter mat, which is more typical for DP competitions, and then a 20 centimeter mat, which they use in some parts of the country. A little more rare, but they all obviously use that in college and then in international competitions. But this is a stock, pretty typical landing mat, what we would call a competition landing mat. That's gonna be a mat that is 12 centimeters in height um, and usually has the handles where they're affixed to the side of the mat rather than handles that hang off. Um, these mats are a little firmer and they are not to be slid or moved when the athlete is doing their competitive exercises. Those are, those are there, they're meant to stay there, and they're meant to not be touched and messed with by the coaches at all. Uh, moving on, and I think the best way to do this is going to be to go from the smallest to the biggest. If you see down at the end of this row, this is a pretty stock size sting mat. I believe that one is three by six and that would be legal in competition. You could also use the medium size, which I believe is a four by eight, and then the larger, which is a seven by 10. From there, the sting mats, which are predominantly used for either landings on top of a mat or sometimes below the mat, what they're for is for athlete safety. They're simply there to provide a barrier on top of what are oftentimes very firm landing mats or throw mats that we see uh, during competition. In most gyms, mats are broken in a little bit more, and when the athlete gets to competition, not only are they void of their pits and, and they're not able to, to, trip, to compete on the soft landings that they, that they find themselves in their own gyms, the sting mat is a very good intermediate type of softness where it, it provides a little bit of safety for the kids, and it takes the sting out of the landings from their ankles, hence the name sting mat. Okay, the next mat, uh, this is uh, very typical to see on floor exercise and on vault, and even sometimes you'll see it on bars. And we call this a, a four inch throw mat or throw cushion. Okay, and the reason why it's throw is because in competitions, these are mats that you'll see slid in and out, moved constantly, put in a corner on floor, marked for the out of bounds area, and, and thrown from one area to the next. So it kind of got the nickname throw mat. The next one would be the 8-inch version of the same type of philosophy. And you'll notice that the 4-inch mat is uh, wider than the 8-inch mat, and that is simply, at least what I've been told by the equipment companies, is for room on the truck. To do 8-inchers of this size takes up too much room, um, and it would be very difficult to do meets affordably as far as rental is concerned. We call that an 8-inch skill cushion, typically, but it could also be called a crash mat. We've heard that word. Uh, we typically don't like to use the word crash mat because we don't want our kids crashing, but they do come in handy when they do. Uh, but those, again, are mats that are moved in and out uh, in a variety of ways throughout competitions. We see them a lot on uneven bars, especially, being slid in for release moves and the like, um, even for packs and mounts and things like that in the upper levels. Uh, but they're very, very popular in a very safe um, matting situation. They have a little bit newer to the, to the world of competitive gymnastics. They're called pit pillows. The, this line here is made by Tumble Track. We really love them. They're, they're again, similar to a sting mat. They are a, a safety device that we use. The one on, on our right here, this larger one that is very thick, I think this is about a 12 inch, 12 inch mat in regard to height. These are completely not legal for competition at all. It's not acceptable for landings, it's not acceptable for sliding in and out, for release moves, it is absolutely not acceptable for competition. And, and you will probably not see them provided in outside venue competitions. I can't imagine anyone dragging one of these to an outside facility. They're very heavy, heavy they're very awkward. Um, but excellent for putting on a, in a pit, excellent for using as stack mats, for training purposes, but once again, not legal for competition. This little mat, however, is legal for competition in levels nine and 10 only, and it is only to be used to be put in and then immediately removed for release moves or skills of that level or magnitude, okay? It cannot be used as a landing mat, 
It may not be left in during a competition. It's similar to a board. If you use it, that's fine, but you have to remove it immediately or there is a deduction that goes along. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about are panel mats. Um, these you will see at competitions almost every time. They come in different sizes, of course, but the, the typical ones that you will see at competition are this, what we call a smaller version, which I believe is four inches tall. They are two feet by four feet, and they are to be used only for mounting. The exact same thing holds true for the larger version, which are two feet by five feet. They are about eight inches tall off the ground, and once again, can only be used for mounting. They may not be unfolded and used for landings of any kind, but if you wanted to make an adjustment to the eight inches, and, and let's say, pull a couple panels back and then mount off of this height, all of those things are legal to do, but they are not to be unfolded and used in a, in a landing situation of any kind. Obviously, coaches also will sometimes use these to get themselves to be a little taller for spotting. That, of course, is legal, but if they stand on one during competition, in other words, to get up a little bit higher to maybe spot a release move on bars, they must remove that mat the second they are done with it. You cannot leave it there as the athlete does or does not. It would be treated exactly like a board. If you use it, you remove it, or else there is a deduction. What's the reason it can't be used for landing? Number one, I think that it's, it's a safety situation. It's not meant to be that way. That's one of the things that, that the equipment companies talk about a lot, is their, their actual purpose and what the purpose is. The purpose for panel mats is not a landing mat. Okay, the biggest thing I would say, in my opinion, would be the folds in the mat. Okay, because they fold, this joint is gonna have lots of flexibility and could create dangerous situations in regard to landing. Kids could get their heels caught, kids could get into a soft spot area where the, where the joint is on the mat and it could cause issues and perhaps make them fall. Okay, so that's our mat basics. And now we have to do one more basic exercise before we move on to the mats that we use on the different apparatus. So the first uh, is called Arithmetic 101, and you'll have some multiple choice questions. So about how many inches equals 10 centimeters? Your choices are listed. Take your pick. And the answer is 3.93 plus. So that's about 4 inches. So when you read 10 centimeters, think about 4 inches. How many inches is 12 centimeters? You see your choices. 12 centimeters is a little bit more than four and a half. And so you can think of that as four and a half to five inches and not have to worry about the centimeters. And then how many inches is 20 centimeters? Your choices on the left. And the answer is almost eight inches, but not quite. But for our purposes as judges, eight inches is probably sufficient. And then how many inches is 24 centimeters? That's about nine and a half inches. And there's really only one time that you really need to know that, and we will cover that later on today. So I'm gonna review competition landing mats, allowable competition landing mats, sometimes referred to in the RNP as CLM and sometimes referred to by coaches as base mats. You can either have one 12 centimeter mat, remember that was the one that was between four and a half to five inches. If you use a 10 centimeter mat, which is one that's four inches, you just need to put a one and a quarter base mat under it. You can also use a 20 centimeter mat, but as Brad said, those typically aren't used in the developmental program. They're more used in college and in international competitions. Note on the top that you can have any combination of matting may be placed on top of the allowable competition matting. So there's nine inches of allowable competition landing mats. And then we can put another nine inches on top of that. So a summary. A sting mat is a soft mat that's about one and a half to two inches. Panel mats can be used only for mounts by the gymnast or for spotting by the coach, or if they're unfolded, they can be used as part of the base mat. The base mat, when used in that manner, is about one and a quarter inches. Your competition landing mats are either 12 or 20 centimeters. 
Scale cushions are typically four inches or eight inches, and they're also called throw mats. And the eight inch is sometimes referred to by coaches as a crash mat, although that's not the preferred term. Pit pillows are allowed for C or higher release moves at levels nine and 10. And they are required at state meets and above, but not required at meets below that. Resi pits and porta pits are the same type of mat. They're just by different companies. And that's gotten us through mat basics. Now we're going to move on to vault. On vault, we're going to use a true false scheme to discern the differences in what's allowable and what's not for vault matting. So please answer true or false. The hand placement mat may not exceed one inch. That's false. It can be up to two inches. The hand placement mat may be used as a visual aid for forward entry vaults. That's false. It can only be used for round off and front handspring entry vaults. So think of the clue. The hand placement mat is only for vaults that require the hands to be placed on the runway. That's pretty simple if you think about what the name of the mat is. I just never had thought about it until it was time to do this presentation. The hand placement mat may be placed vertically or horizontally on the vault runway. That's true. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about are the things that are typical to your Chango style vaulting um, in levels eight, well, wait, six now, because they get the new timer, so levels six through 10. Um, again, for your Chango style vaulting, which is the round off entry vaults. Uh, hand mats. I only have two different versions, but there are different versions that are out there. This version is made by Carolina Gym Supply, and it is a kind of a pit pillow type material. It's a, uh, a soft inside with kind of a blue jean cover, we call it, like a denim cover. The reason why this was approved is because just like the larger versions, they have installed Velcro. And the purpose of this mat is to be used as a entry mat for round offs and for your Chanko style vaulting. We love it for training. It's a little bit more forgiving to the athlete, but they also can be used in competition. I also would warn you, as I spoke of before, these probably will not be provided. So the week of the competition, we train our athletes on the second version, which is what you see here. This is made by AAI. This is more of a standard mat that you will see at competitions. Typically, they're in two different sizes, and they come in this material, and then also that basketball style material you've seen here on the vault board. Um, this larger version can be turned this way, or it can also be turned long way, which you'll see quite a bit also. Both of those options are within the rules. Okay, back to our true faults. A sting mat may be used instead of a hand placement mat. That's false. A no other type of matting is allowed. A hand placement mat may slightly overlap the vaulting board for safety purposes. That's false. It's actually not considered safe. There's a picture of that mat slightly overlapping the board, and if it slipped, it would not be a very safe condition for the athlete. A gymnast may repeat her vault with no penalty if the hand placement mat slips. That's false. The hand placement mat is not considered to be part of the apparatus or personal equipment. The safety zone mat is required for round off entry and front handspring onto the board entry vaults, and that is true. The safety zone mat may only be used for round off entry and front handspring onto the board entry vaults. That's false. It's okay for any vault, but it's not required except for the Yurchenko style vaults. If a gymnast performs a Yurchenko vault and the safety zone mat is not in the proper direction, a warning is given. A deduction is taken on the next vault if it's not corrected. That's false. The vault is scored zero. It is acceptable to have space between the board and the safety zone mat for groups one, two, and three vaults. That's true. 
The next thing you'll see here is obviously a vault board, and then what we call the safety zone, or the UMAT. Okay, and UMAT because it's shaped like a U. So you'll have coaches talking about that as kind of like a, uh, a nickname for what these mats are called. But the safety zone's purpose is just that. It is a mat that was implemented in the late 80s or early 90s, and what it does is it provides the athlete a little bit more margin of error. So if they're crooked, one foot is on the board and one foot touches the safety zone, it will give the athlete a chance to still make it over the table safely. Okay, same thing in the back, and we see this happen all the time, is the heels get off the back of the ball board a little bit, it happens where the heels get a little bit late, the safety zone provides that, that cushion to give the athlete a chance to still make it over the table, table safely. If it wasn't there, we of course could imagine that if a gymnast were to hit the board crooked like this and it hits, their foot would have, wouldn't have that mat there, that would happen and we would have the thing we none of us ever want to see. Okay, or same thing with it being too long. If, if the athlete was too long, if the foot slipped off as they were trying to go back to the table, that would not be a good situation. So this thing has been really a godsend and it's something that every gym in America either has or should have if you're doing your Chanko matting. It is required for your Chanko style vaults during competition. Also, it can be used for other entries, um, but, the, your, but the hand mats, like I spoke of, cannot be used for other entries. In other words, you cannot try to create a little area that you want your athlete to jump over trying to get onto the board. We used to allow it, but it wasn't the purpose um, deemed by the equipment company, so we had to get away from that. Chanko's, it is required that, it, that it's set, set up like this. Okay, so it, it, I've never seen a coach try to do it any other way, but you will see the mat pulled off a little bit for handspring front entries or for suit entries, and the reason why they do that is because the, the U-mat or the safety zone actually acts a little bit like a muffler, and when you pull it away a little bit, it allows for the board to be a little bouncier because it allows for more airflow. The board would be less bouncy with the collar around it this way, and it will be like this. This would not be acceptable or allowed for your chenkos, but it would be allowed for uh, handspring or Sukahara type entries. Okay. And again, it's because the board would be a little bit bouncier with the mat pulled off of it than it would be with the mat touching. So here's a clue. When your chenko is the call, your eyes should fall. And the importance of that is we really, as judges, need to make sure that that mat is in place. The injuries that an athlete could suffer would be pretty serious, possibly. One thing we can do to help to ensure safety for the athlete is just to make sure when we hear that it's a Yurchenko vault is coming, just look down, make sure that mat is there. A four-inch throw mat and a sting mat may be placed on top of the allowable competition landing mats. The sting mat must be on top. That's false. The sting mat can be either on top or beneath the mat. And here we see an example where you can see the sting mat is underneath the mat that they're placing on the competition landing mat. This is when we're usually judging where our heads are down calculating our score so we never even see that choreography happening. Here's another version of this with a sting mat that is on top of the competition landing mat and the 4-inch mat. It is not required to cover the upright of the vault table, but it is recommended. That's false. It is required to cover the upright, and here's a couple of examples. As you can see, the folded mats are able to adjust to the height of the table, so it will kind of provide a give as the table moves up and down, but will also protect the athlete at the same time. Here's another version, and this one wraps around the vault. It's a little bit more difficult, I think, for coaches to work with because when that's Velcroed together, and if they have to change the height of the vault table, they would always have to unfasten that collar and then refasten it. A total of 18 inches of matting may be used in the vault landing area. That's true, 
You can have a maximum of nine inches may be placed on top of the nine inches of competition landing mats. And as we talk about mats for the rest of this session, that's the general rule. You can have nine inches on top of nine inches of competition landing mats. The mat stack for level six and seven vault must be positioned up against the table. That's false, but the base mat must be against the table. So Linda was demonstrating this in the gem. It really helped me to remember the difference, and I thought I'd like to show you what she has to say. For the level six, seven vaulters, a lot of times the question comes up from other judges. Can they push the mat stack away from the table because they have an athlete that is going to travel farther? And the answer is yes, they can push it away. It still has to have the base mat underneath. They can't move that, but they can push this back because many of these girls land way at the end and the coach can do that. Move on to bars and we're going to use the same format. That is a true false quiz. The first one is a coach may stand on a spotting block or folded panel mat to spot release elements. True. And here what you can see are a couple of different versions of spotting blocks that are being used. On the left here you've got a taller version as well as the smaller version. On the right you see a coach that is actually using the larger version of the spotting block to spot a release move for an athlete. There is no penalty for a coach standing on a board, provided the board is removed immediately after the release move is performed. That's true. This coach may stand on a board uh, as long as they move that board immediately after the release move. The spotting device may remain in place as long as the coach continues to stand on it. That's true. At first, again, I kind of read that and thought, I, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that the, if an athlete has more than one release move that are fairly close together in the routine, it's okay for the coach to continue to stay on that device to await the second release move or perhaps even the third, depending on the athlete. If a coach stands on a chair to spot, a warning is issued first. A three-tenth deduction is taken only if the coach continues to use the chair. That's true. That's another one that surprised me, simply because I would have thought standing on a chair wasn't as stable for the coach and the athlete who's doing the release move, but uh, that is a situation in which we take a deduction after the warning is issued. An 8-inch skill cushion may not be placed on the competition landing mat for dismounts. That's false. You'll recognize it as something that's fairly common for dismounts. A skill cushion up to 8 inches may be placed on top of a 4-inch throw mat for release moves. That's true. A pit pillow, or comparable type of mat, may only be used for D or higher release moves on bars. False, as we said earlier, it can be used for C or higher release moves. Here's an example. Now we're going to move into mounts without a board. If mounting without a board, a gymnast may stand on one or two 10 to 12 centimeter landing mats or one 20 centimeter mat with or without a one and a quarter base mat under or on top of the competition landing mats. Well, this is a case where the wording kind of gets in the way of our understanding. So if we break it down, it's a little easier if you just think of one or two 10 to 12 centimeter mats. For the sake of simplicity, think of that as one or two four inch mats, or one 20 centimeter mat. Think of that as one eight inch mat. And then you can put the base mat on top of it or under the competition landing mats. Okay, that makes it a little easier. Hope the answer is true.
If they mount without a board, they can stand on any of the combinations that are listed there. Now mounts with a board. For level one through five, gymnasts may use any manufactured mat, skill cushion, or spotting device to mount. Is that true or false? That's true. And thanks to Myra Elfenbein for the nice photos of the different kinds of mats, skill cushions, and spotting blocks that can be used for mounting purposes for compulsories. A folded panel mat or a trainer mat may be used instead of a board to mount bars at all optional levels. True or false? That's true. And I think it's usually the panel mat that we get the most questions about, but a folded panel mat can be used uh, to mount bars at all optional levels instead of the board. So here you see some photos of the trainer mat and the standard mounting apparatus on the left hand side and then of course on the right hand side you see the folded panel mat. Those are all acceptable. So now is this okay? And the answer is yes. We can use a folded uh, panel mat and it can be opened to facilitate the height of the gymnast. An inflatable bounding device may be used for mounting. That's false. So uh, if you see an inflatable device, that cannot be used for mounting. A board may be placed on top of a four inch throw type skill cushion for mounting bars. That's true. A trainer mount mat may be placed on top of an eight inch skill cushion for mounting bars. And once again, that's true. Okay, the next true false question is, a board may be placed on top of an 8-inch skill cushion for mounting bars. That's false. This is the one thing about using boards to mount that you have to remember. You can't put a board on top of an 8-inch skill cushion. For mounting bars, a board may be placed on top of a sting mat. Is that true or false? It's true. For mounting bars, a board may be placed on top of a sting mat, placed on top of a four inch throw mat, on top of the competition landing mats. That's true. And here you see a picture of that. Again, something that we see quite frequently with the sting mat on top of the other mats. For mounting bars, plywood may be placed under the board to stabilize the mounting apparatus. That's false except for college where the NCAA still does allow the plywood to be placed under the board. Now for a brief summary. It's okay for a coach to stand on a block, mat, or board to spot, but not a chair. However, you do warn the coach first before taking a deduction if they're standing on a chair. Up to nine inches of competition landing mats and up to nine inches of matting is okay under the bars and in the dismount area. Releases can have additional matting on top of the mats we've just described. That's up to eight inches additional matting. If a gymnast mounts without a board, she can use up to nine inches of matting, any combination, plus the competition landing matting. She can mount with a board, trainer, or panel mat. The board can't be placed on the eight inch skill cushion but the trainer mat or panel mat can. And finally, the gymnast can't mount with an inflatable rebounding device. And that is Okay, now we're gonna move on to beam and floor matting, and this will continue our mystery tour. The good news is that the matting requirements for these two apparatus are virtually identical to bars, so there's not much new to learn. So here for beam, you see just about every possible mat that you would need. You see the competition landing mats, which are the ones that are right next to the floor. And those are the ones that Brad had said they're not meant to be moved. Those are competition landing mats or sometimes called base mats. You see the four inch mat closest to you on the screen, the eight inch mat at the end of the beam furthest away from you, the sting mat to the right side of the screen. On top of that, you see the folded panel mat and the board is next to those mats as well. And this is kind of nice because the competition landing mats are those that are in gray. 
your four incher is the mat that's in red, the eight inchers are at either end of the beam in this picture, and then you have the mount trainer mat. So for mounting the equipment at levels one through five, any combination of competition landing mats and skill cushions may be used for mounting purposes. So you can see this slide was sent to me by Myra Elfenbein, and I certainly appreciate the nice view and the option that it shows that gymnasts can use to mount level one through five. We're going to do a quick review of some little videos here of um, mounting on beam. As you're watching the video, just pay attention to the mats and the board combinations that the gymnast is using. So in those various uh, demonstrations, there were two that are not allowable, and that was the gymnast who mounted from the pit pillow and also had the board on top of the eight inch mat. So our final clues are on floor. Floor is pretty easy. We know that the mat covering the boundary line needs to be marked with chalk or tape. Tape is recommended. It is required at the NCAA level. Chalk may be used, however, in the DP program, and it's supposed to be removed before the next competitor. We'll see that that sometimes doesn't happen exactly. And then uh, if the mat is not marked, the chief judge has a deduction of one-tenth that needs to be taken. Is this okay? It's okay to have the mat on the floor. It is not marked, as you can see. Here you have a picture with the lines marked very nicely uh, for the outside line, but you also have it still very nicely marked for the gymnast who went before. There's no deduction for that, and it's really not confusing in this particular situation, but the coach who had the athlete prior to this should have removed those chalk marks for the next competitor. The same thing here. You see a gymnast who is getting ready to land on a sting mat that has been marked for the corner by a previous gymnast, but it hasn't been cleared. And again, there's no deduction, but it would certainly be helpful if the coaches did remove those chalk marks before. This is more of an example of what happens when coaches are in a hurry, because they often are, trying to get the mats chalked before the green flag is raised. So as you can see in this case, one line is curved rather than being straight, and in the other, the line does not match up with the floor. If a line judge sees this before the routine starts or before the gymnastics signaled, the line judge can certainly try to get the coach's attention and to get that cleared up so that it is clear when calling an out-of-bounds deduction. In this case, you see something that where the chalk lines have attempted to be removed from the previous gymnasts. Unfortunately, it's really not clear which chalk mark is supposed to be in line with the floor out of bounds line. We need to make sure that the line of the mat lines up with the line for out of bounds and that the previous chalk marks are erased to the extent that's possible. Again, I understand coaches are very busy. So for the meet referee, something that you can do to help with this situation is to remind the coaches at the coaches meeting to be sure and to remove the chalk after their athlete competes. 
and to remind the judges at the judges' meeting that the chief judge should check to make sure that the coaches had time to mark the mat before raising the flag, and then remind the line judge to observe the chalk line prior to the beginning of the routine. So now we have four clips for you to answer. Is this okay on floor? So we have one, two, three. Now we'll review those rules that I just mentioned. They're allowed to have up to two mats on the floor. They can be placed separately and the maximum thickness is eight inches. The sting can be placed on top or under the 8 inch scale cushion. Only 1 8 inch scale cushion or 4 inch throw mat is allowed per pass. Matting can be used as either the takeoff or the landing surface. And the sting mat may be on top of or under the scale cushion or the throw mat. So in the rules and policies it says that only one scale cushion or 4 inch throw mat per tumbling pass may be used with no more than two mats on the floor exercise area at any one point in time. I'm going to move on to something that we may not have studied much before and that's corner padding. The corner padding on floor is recommended around corners for concrete and wood floors. It's required for level 6 through 10 competitions and outside venues. The requirement is that there needs to be padding either with unfolded panel mats, other matting, carpet bonded foam, uh, and it must extend a minimum of five feet from the boundary line edge and six feet from the corner of the carpet down each side. And that padding can be attached with Velcro or something similar to avoid separating or slipping. So here you can see the lines uh, that I just read. The padding needs to be five feet feet minimum from the floor out of bounds line and then it needs to be six feet in length on either side. So you've got a good diagram here to help get that cemented in your head when you so you can look for it. And it does need to be secured to the floor. Uh, this is a picture I showed you earlier but what you can see here is that corner matting has slipped away from the carpeted area. So again, if you as a judge can see that, that's something you can draw to the attention of the meet referee or the meet director, or if you're a line judge, certainly you can do the same thing. It's important that we keep that matting secure so that the athlete doesn't land on the hard concrete floor, or in this case, in that little spot in which there's separation. This is a nice picture because it shows the how the corner matting can be Velcroed down and that a appears to be more secure. I'm not 100% sure of that, but it certainly gives the appearance of being more secure than when it's just taped to the floor. At elite competitions and collegiate competitions, on often in podium meets, you'll see the 20 centimeter matting that is surrounding the corners, as you see here, as opposed to the mats, and that's perfectly acceptable. And of course, at the Olympics, congratulations to our USA team. Uh, you saw that that matting goes all the way around the floor area not just the corners. In closing, a few suggestions for how to improve your knowledge of matting. I'd suggest you go to some YouTube videos, identify the apparatus that you're interested in, and then just scroll through those to see what kinds of mats are being used. When you enter the venue and go out on the floor for the first time, just observe the mat setups to get familiar with the mats. As you saw in a couple of the pictures I had, the equipment vendors do a really nice job of putting all of the mats together right by the apparatus. 
So if you just go and look at your apparatus that you're going to be judging, you'll see the various options that are there. And if you have any questions, you'll have time to look it up in the RNP. And then finally, when you're at meets, observe the mats that are being used during warm-ups or while you're waiting for the chief judge to finalize the score. And you'll become much more attentive to the choreography that's required for the coaches to get that matting in place so we can make sure that the athletes are safe. Okay, Linda's got it. Good for you. Thanks very much, and I hope you've enjoyed the mystery of the mats.